Hello, welcome to today's webinar. We're going to get started. I'm Brian Malloy. You can find me on Twitter as Landlessness. Today we're going to talk about a really important constraint from the REST paradigm, and we're going to do our best to keep things um, sort of objective and unbiased, but undoubtedly there will be some opinions soaking into the, into the mix here. We have a fantastic group of folks on Google that are really passionate about the API world. Uh, you can check out that group at groups.google.com slash group slash API craft, or just do a Google search for API craft. And a special thanks to a bunch of folks actually were able to pull together in the last minute uh, to help me put some of this content together and make it much better than it would have been otherwise. So a special thanks to the API craft community. All of these webinars that we create are available on YouTube. If you go to youtube.com slash Apogee, that's our channel. If you hit, click a couple of buttons there, you'll be able to open up and see all of the uh, webinars and other videos that we've created over time. And importantly, there is an IRC channel called API Craft on Freenode, where folks get together and talk about API stuff as well. I'd also like to point out that all of the material that I'm sharing with you today is available um, under a Creative Commons license. So feel free to grab any of the images or text or anything out of here and reuse it for your own your own stuff. Okay, let's get started. So let's get the warning out of the way. Uh, there's a chance that I'll betray a certain bias I have against using uh, REST when it, when it comes to making really strong web APIs for custom application development. I'm gonna do my best to mask those opinions, but uh, I just wanna let you know where I'm coming from at the beginning in case any of it, any of it leaks out. Okay, let's get started. What is this thing spelled H-A-T-E-O-A-S? Hypermedia as the engine of application state. So to get a really good handle on that, let's put, let's put this in the full context of REST. These are the six constraints uh, that Roy Fielding nailed in his uh, PhD dissertation where he described the architectural style of REST. And the one we want to talk about, really focus in on, is uh, essentially 4D. And somebody asked in the in the chat, how do you pronounce this thing? I have no idea. That's why I'm going to do my best not to try to pronounce it. <laughs> so we can come to that later at the end. So let's break this down. The first three constraints, client server, stateless server, and cache, they, when you combine those together, we essentially end up with the really robust and strong architecture that we have today that allows the web to scale in the way that it does. Essentially what this comes down to is each request into the server from the client must contain all information. There's no, no stored context on the server, and the client has the right to reuse the response data uh, by storing it in a local cache. We'll come back to the fourth constraint, because that's the big one around uniform interface. But for now, we'll move on to the fifth one. The fifth constraint, layered systems, lets us add features like a gateway, load balancer, firewall, and a bunch of other goodies that helps us run this stuff at the scale we need. Each layer provides services to its neighbors, Layers can encapsulate legacy services and protect new services from legacy clients. And each layer, importantly, has a constraint that it cannot see beyond its immediate neighbor. The optional six constraint, uh, constraint code on demand, allows the client to request code from the server and execute it. This way, the server can actually uh, deploy new features out to a client, which provides for improved extensibility and configurability. And uh, the user can also end up with better user perceived performance and efficiency. In case you're viewing this from a pure uh, API perspective, keep in mind that REST was coined in 2000, only seven years after the first web browser ever existed, and it was mainly focused around user interface stories. So the way to think of this is essentially JavaScript going back as part of an HTTP response and being executed on a local web browser. Okay. Now let's get into the big stuff. Let's tackle the four parts of the fourth constraint, uniform interface. And we'll do that with help from the Twitter user interface. So first one, A, resource identifier. This identifies the particular resource involved in an interaction between components. And this is expressed uh, most commonly in the web world today as a URL or URI. This is the URL to the very first tweet ever made on Twitter. The resource representation represents the state of a resource for transfer between components. So here's an example of a bunch of HTML and JavaScript, uh, which is actually what, what comes back from your request to get the first ever tweet on Twitter. And C, self-descriptive messages. 
The idea here is that each message contains all the information necessary to complete transformations. You can think of this almost as a corollary to the um, uh, stateless server cache client uh, paradigm that we started with um, in the first three set of constraints. The idea here is that as each request comes in, all the things that you need to fulfill this request are, are available here. Uh, if you want to think of like a modern app API use, use case, this is where you, you would make sure that your OAuth credentials were coming in with each request as opposed to having that cache um, somehow cached or that context saved on the server side. So D, hypermedia as the engine of application state. That's really what the purpose of our gathering is today. So let's dig into this. So what's implied in that phrase earlier about application state is that we're talking about a state diagram. A state diagram is essentially a directed graph with a bunch of nodes and arcs. And if we zoom in, I'm going to zoom in on that, the green node in this diagram here. And we'll see that in this world, each node is actually considered a state. And each arc is considered a transition. And you can imagine as you're moving across or you know, within or among or around the state machine, essentially you're moving from one state to another via a transition. This is really basic uh, computer science 101 stuff. This has really important meaning when it comes to understanding REST. And I'm just going to read this whole quote from uh, Chapter 6 of Roy Fielding's dissertation. A lot of people you know, point you to Chapter 5 and then just read that, but Chapter 6 is just filled with nuggets about what has actually been learned um, from experiencing REST in the real world. So this quote goes, The name representational state transfer is intended to evoke an image of how a well-designed web application behaves. A network of web pages, a virtual state machine, where the user progresses through the application by selecting links, those are your state transitions, resulting in the next page, representing the next state of the application, being transferred to the user and rendered for their use. So essentially, this is really simple. States in the state machine are web pages, and transitions in the state machine are hyperlinks. The key to implementing, hate, a, I'm sorry, I don't want to pronounce it. The key to implementing hypermedia as the engine of application state is actually pretty simple. The idea is that in each response message that goes from the server to the client, if you include links for the next request message, you're pretty much on your way. So here's a visual of what this might look like. So in this world, you have an application user who's using a browser-based app. Then the browser-based app is going through something that complies to the REST interface, and it, acts, it accesses a UI server, which was built, um, the application running off that UI server was built by an application developer. So what happens is it, the green arrow comes in as a request from the browser through the interface to the UI server. The orange arrow comes back, and it includes two chunky things. One is the actual request that, you know, the response for the request that you wanted, and then all of the, the, the links that are go around that, which will take the user from the current state of the state machine to the next one. To make this really simple, here we're looking at the Twitter UI for, in a browser for um, the first tweet ever made. And you'll see that the core thing we're really looking for is the text there, just setting up my Twitter, right? That's the heart of, you know, what is probably the simplest uh, state around. But you'll notice there are a bunch of other things on this page that allow the user to take action. And those are pretty much the transitions. So this is what this actually looks like. This is the, um, this is the state diagram for this one node in Twitter, which is arguably the simplest web app ever built. Um, by the way, this, was the, uh, this took a very long time to build, so I hope you all are really appreciating the beauty of this slide. So what's actually happening here is there are, th about, there are more than 30 different spots um, or transitions that you can go in this state machine from just looking at a tweet. Um, so it's not an insignificant amount of thought that gets, goes into creating one of these things and making it work right, which is why good web API designers are really sought after, because you have to make all this stuff work well. Cool. So essentially what we saw there was one transition in. I just did a Google search for uh, Jack's first tweet, and it, that was my transition into that page on Twitter. So I went from the Google state machine to the Twitter state machine, and I got 32 transitions on the way out. Okay, as a quick aside, the three greatest inventions of all time are bicycles, beer, and the hyperlink. With the browser, I can start at twitter.com and navigate my way through every state of the entire Twitter application, and it's absolutely amazing. Okay, now we're going to probably start the debate in the chat about whether bacon and beef and other things should be included in the, in the list, and we can go on for that forever. So really, if you think about it, this whole thing about having hypermedia as the engine of application state is nothing short of miraculous. I remember the first time I'm old enough to remember using a Mosaic browser in 1994 and the first time I was able to 
stop the page from loading and click and load something else that I thought was more interesting. I was just blown away by how beautiful that was. So it's good stuff. So this stuff is not scary. Godzilla is scary. An inflatable Godzilla in a shopping cart in a back alley is not scary. So the key constraint to making the web work is essentially this one that we're talking about. The idea that the hypermedia is the, is the um, engine of the application state. And the browser is a fantastic example of that. But let's go to the next step, which is what most of us are concerned about here. And let's look at the hypermedia constraint when it comes to APIs. And we're going to do this appropriately enough with some help from the Twitter API. So this is how um, things work when we're talking about an API. It looks very similar to a UI, right? We're going to do an HTTP get on, a, on that same tweet. And it's going to go to api.twitter.com with the right version number. And what comes back is, in this case, a JSON representation of the resource. You'll notice it looks, it's pretty much the same info. I see the text, which is just setting up my Twitter. I see that it's coming from Jack Dorsey. What we don't see in there, which is where the problem comes in, is there are zero hyperlinks. So essentially, if we were thinking about this as a state machine, uh, we just hit a dead end because there's no way to get out of this state of the state machine and onto the next one. So if you're looking at this from a pure um, hypermedia as the engine of application state, this is, gets an F, a funking grade. It's not good. So the, Next question is, well, how many links should we have in there in order to respect the constraint? Well, I think the simple answer is you should have at least one. In this case, um, the one that's really obvious is in this whole you know, response representation, there's one um, obvious link, which is you would link to the user, which is Jack. So let's say we put this link in here then to link to Jack. Um, now we can pretty much say that now this, the, we're not at a dead end in terms of the application state. The, um, the API client could actually move on to something else. But there are a few questions that come to mind. So I'm just gonna rattle off these questions because they're ones that I've heard from a lot of people when I've helped them figure out their API strategy. And I don't have the answers to all of them. I think they're really good questions and maybe some other folks do. Um, so the first one is now are we compliant with the hypermedia constraint? I'm thinking probably we are. It's just, you know, the, the, the follow-up question would be, is it a really robust app? And the answer would be no, because we know the UI had 32 some uh, transitions out of this state and this one only has one but it probably is compliant. The next question, if we add another link, does it change the consuming application's state machine? So if you think about this in the world of um, APIs and apps, the app probably has its own idea of what the state is. So if we add another link to it, does that need to change? So you can noodle on that one for a minute. Is it okay for the developer to ignore included links? So if we push these out through the API and they're sitting there in the API response, what happens if the developer decides not to use them? Are they violating um, the rules of what we're trying to accomplish here with the hypermedia constraint, or is that perfectly acceptable? Another question, can the developer add out of band links to her app? So this is to say, yeah, you know, you gave me all this stuff, but you didn't include the next and previous tweet. So I wanna include the next and previous tweet. So I'm gonna go add those two state transitions to the state machine, is that acceptable? And what happens when an app relies on multiple APIs? So we're, you know, in the case where we're using the Twitter API, but let's say we also would like to pull in the Foursquare API, which is a very common use case, which happens every day in the app world. So now who is responsible for the state machine? Is it the Facebook API or the Twitter API, or is it my, my new app? Here's another question. If the Twitter API had complied with the hypermedia constraint, when Lauren Brichter, uh, this guy, created Tweety, which we all know was acquired by Twitter and is now essentially the default Twitter app, would he have been able to decide which user actions to include in his design? Could he have made it look like this? Or would those decisions have been driven by the links in the response from the Twitter API? Which of course looks something like this. So when you put all this stuff together, this is why we end up with so much confusion and angst and conversation and debate about what this hypermedia constraint is all about. Here are things that we do know for sure. Nearly all popular web UIs adhere to the hypermedia constraint of REST. And nearly all popular web APIs do not. Almost all of them, in fact, all of them that I know of, violate the hypermedia constraint. So the question is why? And we're gonna go on and, and get, in, get into this stuff. So let's examine the two worlds. In the world where we see really high adherence to the hypermedia constraint, it looks like this. We looked at this diagram before, but from each, we're gonna look at each persona's perspective here, starting from the right. So the application developer is crafting the interface, also known as the state diagram. The REST interface is guaranteeing that hypermedia 
is the engine of the application state and the app user is actually deciding where to click also known as they're choosing which uh, state transition in the state diagram to to hit now a couple salient points here the person who crafts the experience also known as the state diagram and the app user have the rest interface between them so we know that we can ex the application state will actually be driven by hypermedia because rest is in there guaranteeing that and interestingly the hypermedia links are given directly to the app user at runtime so the the when the hyperlink crosses over that rest interface it goes directly to the app user in order to decide how they want to navigate the state machine so essentially what that means is the hypermedia in each response is genuinely the engine of application state because for the user unless they go in and hack the url in the browser address bar they're really going to have to adhere to the application state okay so this pattern is not limited to just user interfaces we also see it in cases where we do syndication fees through xml um, standards like atom and rss in this case it looks very similar um, however one of the key persona has changed this is no longer an application developer building HTML and JavaScript on Ruby on Rails or something this is a content publisher just publishing content and they're crafting stories categories and related media also known as a state diagram in this case so uh, same thing applies the rest interface is sitting in the middle guaranteeing that hypermedia will be the engine of application state and the app user using something like a feed reader from Google or others is deciding where to click and change the state so the same things apply between the two cases and keep in mind that the, the the representation of the resource going across the interface is actually XML okay but this is where it gets tricky because the world of applications and web API's seems to be fundamentally different in this world um, just to set the context for what I'm talking about here in this world I'm talking about the idea where you have an API server it's available for application developers to create apps and the idea is there are probably multiple application developers creating multiple apps to be used by an application user so a couple things to point out in this world um, the first is that the user is the same the user is still deciding where to click and change state but a significant thing has happened we actually have three app developers creating three different user experiences which means three different state diagrams and the interface um, actually is not doing a very good job of adhering to the hypermedia constraint so the person who crafts the experience the state machine and the app user in this case they do not have the rest interface between them the rest interface is essentially behind the application developer and also and this is another important distinction those hypermedia links they're not going from the server directly to the app user at runtime instead the hypermedia are given to the developer at design time and then really um, it's up to the developer to decide which of those links they're putting inside of their application for the user at runtime so this we've fundamentally gone from direct to indirect so we need a Yoda moment here because I know a lot of people freak out when they hear stuff like this um, we usually think of Yoda as being quiet and calm and wise and all that stuff but in this scene this is actually him being very upset that Luke Skywalker is unable to lift the X-Wing out of the swamp and he's actually pounding his shillelagh on the floor um, and what he's saying here is uh, you must unlearn what you have learned um, and for me personally I used to call the whole world of popular web API's that were not compliant to the hypermedia constraint and I knew weren't soap I used to call these things pragmatic rest but now that I've spent a bunch more time thinking about this uh, that was a big mistake because um, the way that things are usually used um, as web API's has nothing to do with rest especially if you understand um, how deeply important the hypermedia constraint is to making something be truly restful so um, this again is designed to be as an introduction so instead of going into a bunch of details here we're going to ask the question um, that we that we see a lot from folks who are struggling with what to do about the hypermedia constraint in the context of web API's so the first question is essentially should we go down the path of enforcing hypermedia as the engine of application state that's the first question and the second question um, which they ask um, they actually view it as the same question as the one that we just asked but it's actually different and the second question is should we include links in our API responses so let's go ahead and tackle them because they turn out to be different answers so the first answer from my perspective is for an API to truly be compliant with hypermedia as the engine of application state uh, state constraint it requires that the client app itself also be compliant 
to that same constraint. So I think what we're looking at is a user interface app driven by web APIs that would be akin to a feed reader for syndicated content. So it would look something um, like this, but it would be designed to handle generic web APIs. So in this world, the application developer is crafting a system of interrelated resources, also could be viewed as a state diagram, and putting it up on an API server. And then the REST interface is guaranteeing hypermedia is the engine of application state. And the client, which is understands how to traverse a RESTful API, um, will also adhere to that, that constraint. And the user, again, is deciding where to go. Now, I don't know that a browser like this exists. I know at Apigee, we've built something similar to it called our API console, which allows a user who, in this case, happens to be an application developer, cruise through an API re request and response in order to figure out where things are going. But I don't know of one that actually hits, say, a normal user that's unaware of the API. It might be an interesting thought exercise, and I'd love to hear if folks know if something like that exists already. Okay. Um, as I was working for this uh, Elastic Path on Twitter, I actually had this great analogy um, where if, when things are really working well in a hypermedia constrained API, then uh, you can really randomize all of those URLs. You could say base32 and code all of them and never even see what the URL really looked like. And it would be completely acceptable and still compliant to the hypermedia constraint. Um, so this is essentially like Luke Skywalker putting on the mask uh, when he was doing lightsaber training in the Millennium Falcon and doing this blindly. Okay. And so we talked a little bit about this UI browser thing, but there are really interesting non-UI applications that can be totally compliant with the hypermedia constraint. And this is actually from Roy Fielding's uh, chapter five of his dissertation. So I'm just gonna go ahead and read this whole quote because I think it's worthwhile. However, the style does not assume that all applications are browser. In fact, the application details are hidden from the server by the generic connector interface. And thus a user agent could equally be an automated robot performing information retrieval for an indexing service. It could be a personal agent looking for data that matches certain criteria, or it could even be a maintenance spider busy patrolling the information for broken references or modified content. The key across all of these cases is that the hypermedia coming off the server is what drives the, the application from state to state. Okay, so that brings us down to our second question, which is if you're not going down this path, because maybe it seems like science fiction, the fact that this you know, hypermedia compliant browser doesn't exist yet, the question is, should you include links in your responses anyway? And my answer to that is, if you think including the link in the API response will be helpful for the developer at design time, then go for it. Because chances are that the developer is going to use editorial control on that response, but this might be an interesting way, along with some really good API documentation, to help the developer write in context, see where you'd like them to go. Now, personally, I don't believe it's worth the time. I think you're better off doing a better job with your, you know, your error messages from your requests so that developers can focus on test-driven development than doing this kind of thing. But if you think it's gonna make the developer more comfortable and how they work with you, go for it because we all know that we as app developers love the creature comforts of life. Okay, but if you do that, I wouldn't call it hypermedia as the engine of application state because those links are probably not truly the engine of application state for the application user at runtime. And you might also get a beat down from Roy Fielding on his blog. So this is from um, his blog post called REST APIs must, must be hypertext driven. Again, I'm gonna read this whole thing. If the engine of application state and hence the API is not being driven by hypertext, then it cannot be RESTful and cannot be a REST API, period. Is there some broken manual somewhere that needs to be fixed? And I love that quote because I agree fully. So this pretty much takes us to um, what I view is an interesting, fun learning experience about uh, you know, what the RESTful ideas were all about. Clearly in my mind, having spent the last week deep, deep, deep into all the thoughts that people have had about this stuff, I really think that hypermedia as the engine of application state is fundamental to REST. And if you don't have it, then you probably don't have REST, but that is okay because it doesn't mean you need to create your API with REST anyway. Which brings me to my big call to action. We have a boatload of really smart people in the API community. And I think there's a lot of work that we can do together to help move us forward. What we know is that uh, REST with the hate OAS constraint is, and we know what it isn't. At least there's some common acceptance idea of what a, a compliant uh, client, for example, looks like and what a compliant client doesn't look like. We, we kind of know that. We also know uh, pretty distinctly uh, what a SOAP API is and is it, is not. But we're missing something really important. We don't really have an intellectual framework or even a label for the way that many popular apps and web APIs work today. So what we really need is a smart person or a smart group of people 
who care about web APIs and care about the way that we're talking about them and using them to go back and examine those fundamental constraints of REST, right? Take a look at the dissertation and make notes on it and mark it up and question every one of these constraints in the world that we see. So for example, six code on demand is optional. I think there are very few people that would say an API response should include code that gets executed because that implies a, a conflict with constraint number one, which is the client server separation. Um, because if you don't know what code the client is using, you can't necessarily send a JavaScript because it might be written in Objective-C and so on. So anyway, I think somebody should go through and look at these constraints and really get a deep understanding of them, but do it while keeping in mind how custom apps are actually being built by multiple application developers, building multiple applications using web APIs today. So we have some model fundamentally uh, that looks something like this. And if this person or group of people were to do it, it would really give us a new and important foundation where we could come in and we'll all, we could all point to and have a shared understanding of these are the constraints of blank, whatever it turns out to be. And these are the things that are important. And it's different from what we've, what we've seen from pure hypermedia constrained systems. Um, if we do that, I think we'll all have a better shared idea of what we're trying to accomplish. I think we'll be able to communicate more effectively with one another and probably more in a more cool headed manner. And I think we'll be able to create more value for the planet and all the people on it. Ta-da, a picture from NASA, that makes it really cool. Um, but my, my one request is, if you're gonna go tackle this thing or we're gonna tackle it as a group, let's please choose a nice pronounceable uh, acronym because some of these are not very fun to pronounce. Uh, there's some really interesting further reading to be done. This is just a quick uh, list that I've, I've gathered from folks who are giving me awesome feedback on this presentation over the last few days. Um, uh, one of the great ones in there, which will be growing, is my colleague at uh, Apogee, uh, Marsh. He has a pin, a pin board set up uh, around the topic of um, H-A-T-E-O-A-S, and there's some really good stuff in there. I think we have some time still to tackle questions. Why no, why no mention of headers or a meta state? I really wanted to stay away from the HTTP details. I know I put it in there a little bit, but uh, uh, that, that's a great question, Jason. There's probably a whole follow-up to this um, that we could have we put together to get into more of, that, more of that stuff. So David asks, if an API server embeds a link in the response, how to divorce location from separation, i.e. one client may support .json, another .xml, does that then become a request constraint, which then alters the response? Well, yeah, so I think if you, if you put, this is where we get into this debate about whether, I think we were asking is should .json or .xml actually be in the URL or should be down in the accept header? If that's the case, you can give me a quick indication. Um, that's, again, that's kind of like an implementation uh, debate. Luke asks question, if we code to custom media types and rel tags, doesn't hypermedia as the application constraint become helpful? Yeah, I think it really does, but I, I, I don't know that it becomes helpful. I don't know that it actually changes the fact that the, the end user application state is not driven by the API. Maybe you have a different case in mind, but when, most of the time when I see that stuff being used, it's still essentially for the developer to get a handle on things. If you're talking about actually driving it right through the app, then yeah, I think that does get us closer to, the, to that constraint. So Shri asks, what if there are 100 actions over an object? So I think you're asking if there are 100, like say state transitions from one representation to the next through the state diagram. Yeah, and that's very common. I mean, I, we took the simplest web app imaginable, Twitter, and we found you know over 30 uh, transitions out. It's, it's, this is a very common thing to happen in a true hypermedia system, which I would argue for a lot of like kind of simple REST, ap or not, for simple like web API cases, it's, it's overkill. Matt asks, how would you recommend documenting weak transitions by name? Um, would you use the rel attribute? If the client doesn't know all possible URIs, the rel uh, needs to be consistent. You know, I haven't thought too much about that. I'm sure we can do some follow-up stuff um, with the group later on. Um, if the application developer is from Pete, if the app developer has editorial control in between user and API, couldn't a hypermedia web API let the editorial piece be a filter subset to still allow the hypermedia? I think that's actually really interesting. I think there's a bunch of work to be done there and a bunch of thought to go into it. So essentially I could imagine sort of like a container that the app developer has actually got complete control over but then within there, you do allow the real expression um, from the API drive the application state. I'm going to grab one from, it looks like uh, Bob. If it's not REST, then obviously it would be an application working as a kind of REST-like experience. That, of course, is await. <laughs> oh, actually, so that was, that's actually, I love it. That's really <laughs> a great acronym. Let's roll with that one. If there are no objections, we'll, uh, we'll do that and move on. All right, folks, thank you a whole bunch for tuning in. If you like this content, Please feel free to use it, as I mentioned before. Also, 
Um, our mission with this is to get this conversation uh, kick-started. So if you want to help be a catalyst for that, please go ahead and retweet this or put it on Facebook or share it in the user groups you hang out on. And uh, we'll, we're going to post links to this presentation very shortly. But in the meantime, just drive people to the API craft group uh, so we can, keep, can we, we can keep that moving. Like I said, please subscribe to us on YouTube, youtube.com slash Apogee. Uh, we're on Freenode at API Craft. Check out that Google group. And you can also always hit me directly on Twitter or send me an email at brian at Apogee.com. And like I said, please feel free to share this. We'd love to get this uh, conversation started and moving as quickly as possible. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day. Bye now.